I'm into today, which is just I just want to know what in the heck is going on with all of the information out there. And I'd like to know what is it that was key for you to get you started investigating UFOs and alien contact in the first place? Well, I had an early childhood experience at about the age of nine years old. I feel I made extraterrestrial contact. And it wasn't a, a very extraordinary way. I remember coming back from a friend's. I was going down the alley growing up on in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I looked up and I seen something very bright in the sky come down. And it must have been within 10 feet of me. And of course, I was awestruck. And I was wondering, what the heck is this, you know? And I just started communicating to it. Like, what are you? Why are you here? And it answered all my questions telepathically. And at the same time, I could see a sphere with two individuals in it. Very humanoid-looking individuals. And basically, those are my spirit guides to this day. I call them spirit guides. They're not always in physical form, but they're always available for me. I mean, if I ever want to contact them, it's as easily as me just telepathically saying, I need your help right now. Can you help me with this situation? That's how it started. So, I mean, I always had, and after that, I always had an interest in the UFO phenomenon, of course, you know, because I've read a lot of books back in the 50s, you know, Orfeo Angelucci's um, book about his contact with extraterrestrials. And there was always Adamski and Billy Myers and all the famous contactees right. of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So as I got older, you know, I got married young. So I, I postponed a lot of these issues because I had a family to raise. And my focus was on raising my family, you know, making money, paying the bills, you know, keeping them, the food on the table. So I put it off for about 20 years. I was married for 20 years, raised three children. And then we got divorced and we went separate directions. At that time, I started to get back into my education psychology, which always meant for me psychology was about the soul, the study of the soul. Now it's changed a little bit. The focus is different. But for me, even to this day, it's about the soul, the spirit. And so I got a PhD in, you know, in um, psychology and wrote a very interesting dissertation um, for the Saybrook University in San Francisco and it was basically a, I interviewed people that said they had the experience of going to another planet moon or star system you know right there that sounds well that's really pretty far out <laughs> you know it's like somebody would have to be crazy you know a lot of people that are in the status quo or dominant worldview would consider that to be a crazy experience but I know it's not so from my experience I said yeah I look forward to the interview so I interviewed quite a few people for the dissertation. The, uh, my dissertation committee thought it was phenomenal, the research that I did. You know, and I also had probably 370 books related to the topic, you know, about UFOs, extraterrestrials, and, you know, ways of contact that other people have done in, throughout historical records. So I, you know, with that uh, dissertation, they, they gave me a PhD, and of course all the coursework that goes along with it. But, to make a long story short, I did receive the, the PhD after the dissertation was complete. So I, you know, then I started really working hard on how am I going to get my message across, not only to the academia, but to the, you know, people that don't have such a, a slant, you know, academic slant. So I, I started getting my works together and seeing how I could publish it in book form and started uh, to contact publishers. And, of course, I found Inner Traditions Baron Company. They were very interested in my book. And they said, well, send me the first 60 pages of what you would like to see in that book, and we'll make a decision. So I sent them the first 60 pages. They thought, yep, let's do it. And we had a contract very soon afterwards to do the first book, and that's this book here, Extraplanetary Experiences. Right. came out this year. It's the first of my works. There's a number of other books following that will be coming through. Basically, this first book just gives people an understanding of the new term that I invented for psychology and for the world called extraplanetary experience, abbreviated XPE. 
which basically is a self-reported experience of going to another planet, star, or moon. And so, you know, there's a number of ways you can do that. Of course, the most extraordinary way, I think, is, you know, the people that have reported in the past about going to another planet via extraterrestrial craft. And we have those in the book also. But let's talk about maybe even something a little bit more um, direct, uh, like the astronauts going to the moon. The moon is not considered a planet, but it is another celestial body. So let's, I looked at it as a planet, moon, or star. And I, so I interviewed Edgar Mitchell, one of the astronauts that actually went to the moon, walked on the moon, and came back. Oh, yeah. Start off there so people can get a really grounded idea. Most people these days believe that we did go to the moon, and I think they can get the, the crux of it by reading um, Edgar's interview with me in the book. It's the first interview of seven that I have in there. And um, Edgar just basically says, you know, was most incredible was the way back when he was on the moon and coming back and seeing the earth in the distance was like a samadhi experience for him that he's still unraveling to this day. And he's in his 80s now. And, of course, he is the founder of the Noetic Sciences, um, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And so he's really gotten in much more deeply in, in a mystical sense also about trying to unravel the sense of the cosmos. What's this all about? So, you know, there's a number of people that have gone very professional about trying to unravel what's out there in the cosmos. But the way that I'm looking at it, I think it, for me, it's more about going inside myself. This is where I've been finding the answers, and it's reflected on my outer world. You know, like going within and finding inner truth and how that inner truth is subjected to our own personal reality. So, well, you, of course, know, you know, we, we do have a biasness for searching out there. Because traditionally, that's where we've gleaned all of our information, our experiences. But I, I've often wondered about this, too, because we can't let that biasness or previously held beliefs filter out information. And one of the people that sort of woke me up to this was Terrence McKenna, when he starts talking about some of his inner experiences on hallucinogenics. Uh, specifically DMT, dimethyltryptamine. And it got me thinking that if you were an advanced race, an advanced being from even another dimension, it doesn't make sense that you would be coming here through third dimensional space traditionally and knocking on our door. It would make more sense that you would come in through a different frequency, what we would call our inner consciousness, so I'm right with you on that. One of the things I'm wondering about is what was your criteria? Because let's face it, let's be honest here. There's a lot of nuts out there, you know, just all kinds of crazy stories all over the board. I, I go to a psychic fair and there's like three or four people channeling the Palladians and they all have different stories. What was your criteria for picking the people in your book? Because you've had a personal experience, and that's valuable. So yeah. this is something you know. This is the gnosis of what you know. It's not just a belief. But how did you resonate or pick the people, and how did you sort of feel that what they had to say was valid? How I picked the people in the book is I think that I put the awareness out there to the cosmos, and it came back to me. You know, I went, uh, other people know, I do work with a few extraterrestrial researchers, you know, PhDs in the field that have, of course, worked with people that reported some of these types of experiences. I didn't use all of them, but, you know, I have a number of other experiencers, too, that I have not uh, published yet, which will be coming out, you know, in the next few years. But the way that these experiencers came to me, of course, Edgar Mitchell, I just called him and he said, yeah, sure, let's do it, you know, and um, some of the other people... I invited in because I knew of their experiences and they reported to me in the past. Um, some of the new people, um, they heard about me from other people. It's kind of, you know, I think that some of the contactees, if you want to call them contactees, um, do somewhat stick together. You might see them at MUFON or UFO Congresses, uh, people that are 
just interested in the phenomenon and how it's pursuing. A lot of them interested in disclosure especially and how we're going to get this information out to the public. Uh, the other ways that I received the interviews was from, I said, referrals from other extraterrestrial researchers, you know, just personal calls. And then I did a little bit, not much, but I did run an ad in uh, like a UFO magazine. If anybody had an, you know, an experience like this, please call me. Right. Now you say how did you know the legitimacy part of it? You know, I wasn't all that interested in the veracity of the statements, but I'm a psychologist, and I I think somebody that can talk very articulately for an hour and a half with me or two hours about their personal experience about going to another planet, you know, and be. Um, consistent about it, you know, because I, I go over these experiences probably 12 to 15 times before they ever get published. Right. You know, their, their stories are consistent, all the details line up. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're, they're convinced that they're telling me the truth. You know, like I said, it's not me to try to pinpoint the veracity. It's impossible. And lie detector, all that stuff, it's easily uh, deceived, you know. So, I just, you know, I feel it in my gut and my intuitiveness. But you got to remember here, the important factor of my book is the life, the meaningful life changes that these people um, incur through the experience. That's the important part. Right. And so that's what I really bring out in the book, you know, those themes that I extract from the interviews and how there are, a lot of them are very similar. And that's where I found real gusto or the crux of my research is in that these are consistent findings that these people are reporting about and they very much are similar to the historical records you know the historical records basically they're all saying is you know they had contact with ETs you know they're basically related to us um, when are we gonna start getting on board <laughs> you know? so how, how much do you think the church knows about this like when I say the church, I mean like the Vatican, the high up hierarchy of all of this. Okay. Well, of course, it's not the Vatican. Of course, I'm talking about the Vatican, it's pretty high up. You know, there are Vatican astronomers now saying, yeah, there's great possibility that there's other life in the cosmos. They're not denying that any longer. Right. Yeah, they just put up a one of the biggest binocular infrareds at the Antarctic. It, it's to view what might be coming at us from the most southern part of our planet mm -hmm. and of course the the conspiracy theory around that is it's planet x nibiru something like that but i definitely think that they especially after i listened to monsignor balducci remember him yes he, he was the exorcist and he was pretty much handled the ufo alien i think he died in 2008 but he is totally convinced that we have been working with aliens and that they're here and they're coming back and I know the church had to sort of okay what he was talking about before he yeah. could talk, you know. So even though they didn't uh, validate it, just not standing in his way was a validation of somewhat. So you're also, you know, I've thought about this too. Why doesn't the government just tell us? And, and you're a little bit uh, concerned about what, what's it called, the ontological shock of, yes. of exposing this too fast, too quick. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's a reality. You know, I think, you know, Carl Jung also said it back in the 50s, you know, the famous philosopher, psychiatrist, who, you know, a lot of people don't know that he was just enamored with extraterrestrial phenomena by the time he died. He was just immersed with it. You know, it was one of those famous topics that you yeah, could talk about. They, the, the psychological community sort of ignores that, though. Yeah, but now it's like it makes sense, you know, yeah. why he wrote this little book called Flying Saucers back in the 50s, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's written in German. In fact, I sent a, a, the actual original writings from the Young Institute, I sent to Billy Meyer in Switzerland. He didn't have it, you know. Of course, Billy Meyer speaks German. Um, I don't want to get too far off track here, but what I'm saying is that there's a lot of if you want to call it evidence available. And the problem about disclosure, okay, we're going to call it disclosure. You know, there's a lot of agencies now that are putting a lot of pressure on the government to hand over the evidence. Like government's saying, no, we don't have any. Yeah, we like Stephen Greer. 
Yeah, right. Well, and other ones too. And I just, I'm not focused on that because to me, I don't have to convince anybody. You know, like I said, it's an inner subjective experience is how we're going to handle this. And that's what, you know, the context that I'm involved with, they say it's going to continue that way. You know, it's going to be a subjective experience. You know, we're going to give everybody the experience when they're ready for it. So the ontological shock part, I think, is a, a valid reason because, like I was getting to with Carl Jung, he said, what would people think if they started seeing just vehicles, UFOs, you know, flying saucers coming out of the sky? That would mean something and from other planets. I mean, that kind of technology is almost unimaginable for a lot of people. Right. And so oh, I can ha handle it, you know, just bring them on. You know, I don't think it's, it's, it's very realistic. I mean, we can't even handle, you know, little things like a storm, Hurricane Sandy. You know, it's like some people are in, still in shock about that. Could you imagine, you know, being basically colonized by another uh, life form from another planet? Yeah, you know? I, I think that would pretty much be the death blow to the financial institutions, the broken government, the corruption, the corporations. I, I think they would all take a heavy blow because it would take away from their validity as leaders and their power. And I personally think that the government knows a lot. And even Edgar Mitchell says that he's talked to some top-ranking generals that say that they've been working with advanced beings in the Pentagon. If that's true, if that's really true, I think the, uh, the resistance to let this information out is closely attached to alternative energy. And, and that's one way I think the government really keeps control of everything is they keep us addicted to fossil fuels and they don't want free energy to get out there. And I think once they start releasing the energy from aliens, I think alternative energy is going to be forefront in this releasement. And, and I think that's a lot of what's behind this. It yeah. is monetary. I like your economic concerns, you know, and you're probably valid with that. What I'm concerned about, of course, because of the spirituality involved here, is the interconnectedness, the interconnectedness with beings, ancestral beings. And um, I think that's where we were going to really find the deepest amount of meaning is our connection. We are, as far as I'm concerned, extraterrestrials. If they could break down, we're not at this level yet scientifically, but if they could break down our DNA, they would see extraterrestrial DNA within each and every one of us. So once, until that happens, you know, it's going to be a long run. But for me, it's just, you know, since I, like I said, since I've been a young child, I never doubted the fact that there were other intelligent beings in the cosmos. To me, it was just a given. Well, you know, in, in, oh, fact, in fact, they have discovered during the, when they were sequencing the DNA, they discovered that even though we have 46 chromosomes, it appears like we used to have 48, which is what the primates have. But two sets of those chromosomes were fused together in such a way that most geneticists say that they don't see how it could have happened through a normal evolutionary act. It almost had to have been done at a certain point. And by chance, it was done at a point where there's a missing link, where we all of a sudden we jumped from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. So it, it appears like something happened that they actually can pinpoint in our genetics right about that time. And it appears to me from the Sumerian tablets, all the Zachariah Sitchin, uh, Lawrence Gardner, there's a ton of information that gives credit to the fact that we have had extraterrestrial intervention, not only into our civilization, but into our bloodline and our genes. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, I think that, you know, there's validity there. I also think that when we get back to that cover-up, or if there's a cover-up going on, conspiracy, that it would be in their favor if you believe a certain way. You know, it's kind of like what makes the, the economic table go around for a lot of the upper echelon world order people that want to keep it consistent and keep us ignorant and in fear. 
So, I mean, it's worked pretty well this long. They got a good thing going. So I'm just asking people, you know, to go within yourself, find the answers. Don't look so much outside to find these answers, even from uh, famous scientists or whatever. I think even modern scientists these days, you know, really doubt Darwinian theory. It's not possible, you know, when you really right. look at it, if you really break it down. So there's, you know, a lot of modern scientists, uh, neuroscientists, uh, astrobiologists are stating, well, there's a, you know, a good chance that seeing that the Earth is only 4.5 billion years old and the cosmos is infinite, we have no idea how old yeah. the cosmos is, and there's much older planets out there, that there were probably intelligent beings, more intelligent beings, living on other planets, you know, billions of years before Earth was even established. Right. So let's look at that for a second. Could you imagine just a race that had a few billion years of evolvement, how they, even the neocortex, the brain, you know, they probably could have 10 to 12 senses beyond what we have. You know, just think about that for a minute, how evolution, you know, could, I'm not saying evolution doesn't exist, it does exist, but let's look at it a little bit differently. Let's look at it of how, you know, beings could have evolved on other planets, you know, 12, 15 billion years ago. And where would they be at now? Well, they, to some people, they would be considered gods because they're so evolved. You know, they have the ability to teletransport. They have the ability to go beyond any of our five senses. I mean, it makes sense to me. And that's what I'm coming up with. It's kind of my own theory is how we're related to these beings. And everyone has the ability, you know, these psychic abilities if they feel they want to cultivate that. Yeah, I, I think even we would be considered gods to people on this planet 500 years ago. But look what we've done in 150 years. We've gone from horseback riding to walking on the moon. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, I don't think we can imagine what a civilization could do in a thousand years or a million or even a billion. I, I think we would be talking about not only interplanetary visitors, but interdimensional visitors. We're just now realizing that this is one tiny slice of possibly an infinite number of dimensions that we're experiencing. And, and I hear people say, well, you know, why don't they come here and say hello? Well, yeah, we're the little ant hill in Africa, but it might be even far, far, far more remote than that. Our whole universe could be so remote as compared to some of these other universes on other levels. And, and I think we're just now getting discovered. Like, when I look back at pre-Sumerian history, the, the Sumerian tablets, the Anunnaki, and, and you look at 200 mythologies, every culture that has a written or verbal past, they all talk about beings that came down out of the sky and taught them things. But I think those beings were pretty uh, primal compared to the beings that are visiting us today from within us. We're being visited and um, influenced on a very, very uh, spiritual, conscious level, I think. Just slight little nudges towards conscious, spiritual awareness. And what's your feelings on all of that coinciding with 2012 possibly being the beginning of waking up to a golden age. Okay. Well, we're already in a golden age. It depends on where you want to put yourself, okay? 2012, nothing different is going to happen, okay? Because we're already there. It's like, you know, the coming of, the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is already here. <laughs> Christ consciousness has always been here. You know, it's like, when are we going to be able to tap into what's there? That's why I'm saying putting too much influence on the outside of ourselves only creates more problems. We ha every, every one of us has the answers within themselves, and that's what I promote. You know, and people, I'm not looking for a following. I'm not a cult leader. You know, and I'm not, I don't even care if you buy my book. <laughs> all, all that I'm saying is you got the answer just like I do. Go inside and get it. It's there. And how did you know, let's say, well, how, that sounds really easy to do, but how do you really do it? You know, I just I look at prayer and meditation. It's basically very simple. You know, praying is asking for what you want. Meditation is 
listening to what you get. Right. Now, if you're able to still your mind, you know, and you know, pray and meditate every day, I guarantee you the answers will come eventually. But, you know, there's so much hype. And getting back to the drug issue, I've got to be really explicit and clear with you about this. I don't do any drugs. I don't even do caffeine. You know, I don't drink coffee. I don't drink alcohol. I don't do hallucinogens. I don't, you know, I don't smoke marijuana. I don't do any of those things. I keep my mind as crystal clear as possible. And that's how I feel that, I mean, there was a time when I did do my experimenting, okay, in my 20s, you know, but it really led me up the wrong path, just to be honest with you. Don't need any of that stuff. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. And I really want to put that out there to make it clear that those are not needed in trying to get to the inner self, you know, to where the answers are. We just, you know, we have it there, just getting back. I think self, if I was to promote anything, it would be self-hypnosis or self-relaxation. The way I used to do it when I was younger, I used to sit in a hot bathtub and get totally relaxed. And that's when I started feeling like what I could feel and what, you know, going to a deeper part within myself. Just that hot water therapy, you know, in a safe calm environment without distractions and then as I got older I went through rites of passages through Native American rituals you know it was another good way you know vision quest and um, you know um, basically deprivation you know doing without food and water for days you know can put you in another state too but then you learn like okay how can I put this all together to reach those states in a different way and what stood behind everything was a prayer and meditation and I can go into that at any time and that's how I think I got you know, better contact with the beings that my spiritual guys, I'll call them, you know, that I think have really been helping me uh, understand myself and at the same time bringing out, you know, what the message is for others. Yeah, I, I think what you're talking about right now is, is really important, especially in today's world, because most of the drugs that are out there are just poison. Uh, I think the only thing that I would take a little bit more serious is ayahuasca. You know, people like uh, J uh, Hancock, Fred Allen Wolf, they, they all talk about this. And it's been quite a while for me, but when I was in South America, I, I tried some ayahuasca, and that did open up some inner doors that I, I have never gotten even close to with meditation. But after I did that, by using meditation, I could recognize the path. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like like ayahuasca gave me um, a photograph of where I needed to go. And with that in mind, I had sort of a, a target, a direction, a focus for my meditation. And then it became pretty apparent that there comes a time where you have to walk away from any kind of a external molecule that would interfere with your consciousness. And use what you have because actually, the the active in, the molecule is dimethyltryptamine (DMT), and that's actually produced by your pineal gland from within you. So there's a reason for that. But uh, ayahuasca was a kickstarter for me. But like I say, it just sort of kickstarted me and put me on the path. And wow. now it's uh, it, it is an inner journey, like you say. Yeah, that reminds me of Carlos Castaneda. I'm sure you know who that was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and all the hallucinogens he described doing. But basically, in one of his books, he says, there was no comparison to all the drugs he's done. He says the most meaningful experiences were when he was clean, cold, sober. Right. And, and, and it took, but it took that to get him there. You know? well, I'm not saying it's going to take that to get anybody there. Yeah. You could do some real damage with some of those things. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. And people I'm tend not to do promoting. that. <laughs> so what does your daily life consist of? Well, my daily life is I basically get up at 4 in the morning, start my day about 4, and then that's usually the clearest time for me to after my dream state because I usually have three dreams a night. And as soon as I get up, even during you know maybe 11, maybe 2, and then the last one would be right around 4, write my dreams down, go over my dreams. Uh, bring that into my consciousness and get on with my day. My day basically consists of, you know, I, I'm the founder and director of a nonprofit called Divine Spark. And 
the mission of Divine Spark is to be of service to poor and in need people. And so we service the local homeless. Um, we work on an Indian reservation, a Pine Ridge Indian reservation. We do a lot of work trying to just help people meet their physiological needs, you know, basic bottom line stuff for people that are, you're you know, considering suicide and, you know, just get in there and, you know, help these people as much as we can. Right. And we think it's really rewarding work, and I think that's, you know, a big part of what I do is my service work keeps me to where I think I need to be, and that's serving the poor, which I think is a really important part, because I think we're all in this together. You know, we see such a split between the upper classes and the poor, and it always bothered me ever since I was a little kid. And I said, well, when I get older, I want to do something about that, you know. So I, I dedicated my life to service, you know, about 12 years ago when I got involved with the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. So I'm basically a very service-oriented person. I do advocacy. Right now we're trying to help somebody, a person that was um, committed to a state hospital and shouldn't have been, you know. This person was poor and they needed to get her out. So there's all, all little things that we get involved with, sometimes legal issues. Most of the time it's just um, doing a good presentation for officials to let them know that we are advocates for poor and homeless people and that through that we can raise awareness if need be. Because you know, sometimes awareness is all it takes to help people get out of the predicament that they may be in. Yeah, just putting the light of consciousness on almost anything mm -hmm. dissolves a lot of what we would be afraid of or hate or anger. So tell me, Thomas, are you, are you having experiences at this point in your life with ETs? I constantly have experience. Like I said before, let me reiterate this, that I can have contact at any moment I want to. It's always there for me. I can, you know, request contact and I'll get an answer immediately because my guides are, are with me all the time, consciously. Can you get specific answers? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll have to talk about that sometime because it, yeah, that's that's how I live my life. Yeah. You know, I go to, you know, I I just go for them as my mentors, basically my guides. I call them, you know, and I get information from them. And even a lot of times, you know, if you're if you do study your dreams, your personal dreams, sometimes they can be a little confusing. At least for me, some some of them are, and I just don't have the answers right away. What the heck does this mean? You know. Yeah, like you, um, know, you know what? Let, last night I had a dream, and, okay. it, and it was about Prometheus. You know, mm. Pr Prometheus he got in trouble with the other gods because he he stole fire and gave it to humans. But I had a dream last night that it wasn't fire, and to use the name of your organization, it, it was a divine spark. That my dream was he got in trouble for stealing the, the secret to the fire, the life force of spirit and infusing it in the genetically altered beings. It could be because I, I just watched Prometheus and these people were, they were called engineers, you know, and they engineered human beings. But mm -hmm. I, I had a dream last night that the fire was actually the divine spark that was infused into us and he got in trouble from the other quote unquote gods for doing that but I think that dream was trying to tell me something I think that dream is trying to tell you something too and of course only you can really define what it has for you but you know if that was my dream you know, I would, I would consider that a dream that is letting me know that not everybody's going to support what I do. And this is realistic for me. Right. You know, as many people as are supporting me and holding me up, there's just as many pulling me down. <laughs> I think you learned that in Palo Alto, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, I did. You know, no good deed goes unpunished, okay? And that's just the way it is. And yeah. you just got to accept this part of it, you know? So well, You know what? I, I, I was talking to David Icke once. And he said that that was like a, a pivotal point in his life when he was so ridiculed, he couldn't even walk down the street without people laughing at him. He'd walk into a bar and people just bust out laughing. But it forced him to get over it and not really care what people think. Mm -hmm. and, and he said it opened up a whole nother life for him 
of exploration because now he isn't confined by the boundaries and the limitations of his ego being concerned about feedback and being supported from other people. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's very true. And you really go into deep states of loneliness. And when you experience those deep states of loneliness is where a lot of the answers are because that's when you find out that you're not really alone. Yep. Well, Thomas, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Well, in closing, you know, I, I, I definitely would like to you know, tell the listeners that there's no reason to look outside for extraterrestrials because they are within us. We are extraterrestrial, okay? Each and every one of us have the genes. Now, it's up to the, the person to go out and explore and cultivate that. And there's no rush. You know, whenever you're ready to start the task, it's a task. It's hard work because yeah. it means, you know, going into doing that inner work that is, is difficult sometimes. And, you know, how we can all be so influenced by our exterior world, you know, for whatever reasons it may be. I was, I was thinking, you know, like all the things that we want in life, you know, a nice car, a nice house and, you know, good relationships, you know. In a sense, we have to put a lot of that to the side. You know, and go deep within, you know, what are we about? You know, yeah. Who are we? You know? <laughs> My God. You know, I, I get up every day, Thomas, and there's not a day go by that I don't go, oh, my God. You know, just the, the rush of my own existence is so incredibly amazing. I, I had somebody ask me a while back, what do you think the most incredible, amazing thing about life is? And I was thinking, oh, my God, there's like all this stuff. But I think the most amazing thing is that there's people out there that are walking around that don't think it's amazing at all. I don't know how they live that kind of life where they, they don't see the amazing, incredible mystery that we are living and breathing and walking through. Well, you know, I can see how they can do that because every, you know, most people feel very comfortable within the status quo and in what's called dominant worldview. And it's kind of a, you know, safe kind of fuzzy place to be. Yeah. I mean, they don't realize what they have to give up to be in there, but that's besides the point. They're with the status quo. They're with the majority of people think and they feel comfortable there. They don't have to take any negativity from anybody else. Hey, the majority feels this way. You know, we're powerful with this, you know. And that's where I can see where people fall into it, you know, because they feel a sense of security there, although it's false security, okay. There is a feeling of security for them there. So, you know, I never punish anybody for whatever they want to think. I'm just saying when people are ready to expand their consciousness, it's there for you too. But like I said, it is definitely a lot harder way to go because now when you start – getting out of that box a little bit, the box being status quo, world dominant worldview, you're going to start taking some ridicule. You're going to be questioned. And people are going to keep questioning you, and they're going to want to put you in a different box. They're going to want to put you in the crazy box, or there's something wrong with you box. And if they can, they'll ostracize you. So you've got to be ready for all that. But it, it doesn't matter, you know, when you really feel connected to your inner being because – Nothing is going to, you know, demolish that. It, it's such a, the security comes from within, I guess what I'm trying to say, not from outside. Yeah, and, and like everything as it is above, so it is below. Everybody knows that there comes a time as you're waking up of a morning when you can't go back to sleep. You, you become too much, you're not fully awake, but you can't go back to sleep. And I think that's where I am. I, I'm just to the point to where now I know that my path has to continue towards awakening. And as I do that, my dream life crumbles. The the social constructs and the, everything that I thought was important seems to be disappearing and not making sense in the same way that as you wake up, the dream doesn't make sense anymore. And so I, I guess that's where I am. Just... Uh, at the beginning well, of awakening. Beautiful. I'm, I'm glad you shared that because I think that's a really wonderful place. But at the same time, it could be a little scary because it's something new. You know what I mean? But I would just 
really support your search for yourself, you know, and stay on that on that goal. Keep the goal to finding out the answers from within yourself. And I, like I said, they're there for each and every individual. And the more that we can gain access to that by observing some of that silent time, some of that loneliness time. I know it's kind of difficult to say, you know, taking some really quality time alone every day. Start with one minute a day. Work up to five. Work up to a couple hours, you know, of really by yourself in deep states of meditative consciousness. Yep. And you'll be clear as a bell. And it's not going to be probably what status quo and worldview, dominant worldview is telling you. <laughs> yeah, it's they're not exactly supportive of it. And But how many people would want to put that much time? It's been my experience that not too many people. Yeah. It, it's, it's not too many people. And the, the people that do do that, they're not, uh, how would you say, noisy, loud people. You, you don't notice them. They're the quiet faces in the crowd or at the party or walking down the street, the, the soft, mild-mannered people. And we're used to listening to the, the loud-mouthed people and the hee-hee, hurrah people, you know. And, but there's a lot of us out there. And I, I noticed this. You know, doing the publishing thing, we go to lots of events. And when we go to an event, everybody's there trying to impress everybody else with what they know and what they do. And But more and more, I'm noticing people, quiet people, standing in the background. And, and these are the people that I like to communicate with. And I'm starting to see that we're recognizing each other through our visual connection. And when that happens you feel a connection, a conscious connection with another person that you're resonating with and it you can feel it. I can feel it in my heart area. It, 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 there's a resonance that I feel in my heart when I meet somebody that's on that that field of frequency. I agree with that also. That's what I base my interviews on. I call it sympathetic resonance. You know, when you're, you know, you can just feel something intuitively when the connection is there, right? You know, and uh, there, you know, it's, you know, it's about as simply as I can define it. That you feel that warm, fuzzy feeling inside yourself when you feel like you're on the same wavelength with somebody, and they under we understand each other. So the the next time I come to Nevada City, maybe I'll email you, and we could meet for coffee or something. If you're sure, around. that'd be great. Yeah, I'll be there in January. Okay. So maybe after the first year, I'll give you an email, and we could just meet up, have a cup of coffee, and uh, yeah, sure. Chat so some more. come over to my office. I'll show you around, and um, yeah, we can maybe go for a walk or something. Yeah. Why Why don't you email me your all of your information, telephone number? Okay. And you have all of mine. If you're ever in Chico, we live out on ten acres at a place called the Goddess Temple, and it's really nice out here. It's uh, okay. Secluded. Nice place to come and visit. So if you're ever in Chico, give me a call. Uh, thank you for the invitation. That's Absolutely, nice. Thomas. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your time and thank you for this. And I'll be sending you a link once it's up. All right. Thank you. All right. You take care. Have a good day. Yep.